our French Firearms uh, series. This series is going to be dedicated to self-loading, or semi-auto if you like, uh, French battle rifles of uh, World War I and World War II. Well, to start things off, we have a relatively unknown critter. This is a French Madel 1917. This is sometimes called the RSC, which is the, uh, the initials of its manufacturer, Ribao Sutter and Chachat. Uh, well, my, my speech says Chachat. I don't know exactly how you pronounce it, but I'm going with how the Stephen Hawking in my computer says it. But yeah, this was one of the very, very first self-loading rifles to be adopted by any military and I would argue the first to be mass produced. Over 80,000, somewhere between 80 and 85,000 of these were produced in 1917 and 1918. This is a semi-automatic rifle. It holds five rounds in in-block clips. They are proprietary. This is the, the 1917, so they're proprietary. You loaded them from the bottom, you put them in, and then you closed it. So obviously it's a very bizarre design by today's standards, but that's what they were working with. I'm not going to charge the weapon. These are old. They were kind of made of so-so uh, metal back 100 years ago, and you know, being 100 years older hasn't improved them. So this one I pretty much baby, because uh, good luck getting replacement parts. It has a standard long label style barrel. It does shoot 8mm label, 8x50. It is a rimmed round, which was problematic. It has a manual safety, which is, if you know, a pretty unusual thing on a French gun. But since this was an automatic, they thought it was necessary. Well, in France, they were really uh, early on. They, uh, you know, they pioneered smokeless powder in the 1880s. And as early as 1901, they had some working prototypes of self-loading rifles. Those prototypes used the uh, direct impingement gas system, which is still used very much today in rifles like the AR-15 and 16. But they abandoned that when they went to this uh, 1917 pattern. This is a long stroke piston. It does have, I guess you could kind of call it an adjustable gas system. This screw here leads directly to the gas port. So the more you screw it in, the tighter the port is, and then you can unscrew it to clean it. One of the reasons the RSC was adopted, it actually is built with many of the same parts as the Berthier and the Lebel. The, uh, the furniture is essentially modified from the Lebel, and the barrel is off of Berthier. If you see again, moving back here, it has a very similar bayonet lug here and here, and then down here, stacking swivel. Um, very similar rifle sights. Actually, I think they're identical to what you find on the uh, infantry rifles. And of course, the internals are uh, proprietary to this gun. Uh, it does not have a bolt hole open of any uh, striper style. It is quite complicated. And uh, yeah, it um, when it was kept clean, it worked well, but it was highly susceptible to dust, dirt, and mud. Which is, uh, it's very fortunate that those were in short supply in the trenches of World War One, right? So <laughs> these uh, these went out of action pretty quick. Um, they were kind of mixed. Uh, they weren't terribly well received by French soldiers. They loved the fact that they had a um, an automatic weapon at a time when um, everyone else had bolt actions and at a time when even the light machine gun didn't really exist. But they were highly susceptible to debris, as I said. And it only took five round magazines, or five round clips, and uh, which were so-so in that. You know, it just it, it it's that struggle between being conservative and uh, modern. So uh, the the feed system was very conservative. As, also, as you can see, this is a full length rifle. It, it's not the heaviest thing in the world, but it's not light. This receiver is, of course, machined and everything. They did develop a carbine version called the 1918. However, it really did not go into production until the very end of World War I, and uh, only uh, a few thousand, I think around 4,000, were made. After the war, this pattern was basically dropped. Uh, France went in a different direction. 
However, the trigger group is what inspired uh, Garand. If you were to look, and I know you can't see inside, but the way it mechanically functions is very similar to what would be used later on the Garand. So they did kind of carry on that way. But as far as the, this design in France, it was pretty much dropped after World War I. The, the 85, 90,000 total between this and the 1918 that were built were used a lot in, um, in Africa. These were basically over-gassed to get around cycling issues. So after the war, many had their gas systems plugged and were turned into um, basically manually operated bolt-action type guns. So a lot of them you find today don't, don't have functioning gas systems. Uh, this one does, uh, which is I, I enjoy. I've had, I've had two or three of these in my hands over the years, and there were some minor manufacturing differences too, and different finishes and different factories built them. So, uh, you know, they, they changed over time. Disassembling this is, if not a nightmare, definitely not fun. <laughs> you can do it, but you've got to be pretty careful some very delicate parts, especially again, like I said, the age, and these were made in the heat of World War I, and, and France was suffering, suffering from a metal shortage, so um, they, they kind of used whatever materials they, they had at hand. There's a lot of lower grade steels used in these, and uh, some brass, bronze, whatever, you know, what, what you might have. But um, interesting for what it was, being uh, the first of its type, and it definitely shows kind of that transition style from uh, long infantry rifle to what would later become an automatic rifle. But um, by the time of World War II, these were basically all out of service. They'd been shipped off to the colonies and, you know, most of them got destroyed or, or mined for parts because they quit making parts for these. So they had to, you know, cannibalize existing rifles. So today there, there aren't that many still in working order in the world and even fewer in the USA. So I thought we'd start off by sharing this uh, somewhat forgotten old gun. Well, we'll move on. All right, our next rifle is a Moss or MAS Model 1944. As you can tell, this rifle was adopted during World War II. It is a self-loading rifle, chambered for the then new 7.5 by 54 French cartridge. It's a Semi, well not semi rimmed, it's a recessed rimmed or rimless round, same thing used in the, the Moss 36 that you saw in our other videos. Opens up. You can feed it by stripper clips or detachable mags. These are 10 rounds. They're kind of interesting because the, uh, the mag catch is actually on the side of the mag, kind of like a clothespin. Very smooth, really. Cocking handle, decent military trigger. Like the RSC 1917, this series of rifles has, a, has an interesting history. After the war, after the First World War, I should say, in the 1920s, development continued on a semi auto, self loading type rifle. And a new cartridge was soon invented, the 7.5 millimeter. Not quite the same as this, it was an earlier version, but for our purposes we'll just say 7.5. I think it was 7.5 by 58 or something. However, uh, funding for uh, war materials, for new weapons, was very, very limited. Um, Europe was going through uh, economic crunch through a depression, actually earlier than even the USA, so there wasn't a lot of money available. So development, although it did proceed in the 20s, went to um, a very slow pace. They had some working prototypes in the 1920s, the late 1920s. They went back to the direct impingement system. They abandoned the long stroke gas piston of the RSC and went back to the direct impingement that was earlier used in the around 1900, 1901. They went to a tilting bolt, which any of you who own an SKS or a Tokarev rifle will be familiar with. Uh, very, very popular. It's used later in the FN, FAO, so on and so forth. So mechanically, very simple, robust guns. They, um, they implemented the, the MAS-36 bolt action, obviously in 1936, and when they were going to the self-loading rifle, they wanted them to have some parts commonality. Uh, most importantly, the furniture is the same, uh, part of the trigger group is the same, and um, the bayonet was the same. If you notice, this is the same style of uh, 
spike bayonet on this one that was in the uh, Moss 36. Barrels are very similar too, as are the sights. Anyway, <clears throat> these were in development. They came out as the uh, the MAS 38, and then later the 3840. And the 3840 was just about to enter into full-scale production when the Germans came in unannounced to France and uh, just really screwed over everyone's plans. Well, the, uh, the Moss 3840 was basically this gun, but with a fixed 10-round mag. So instead of attaching the mag, you would just uh, feed it from stripper clips to the top, much like the uh, early German uh, G41 or, you know, for some extent, the... Uh, M1 Grand, even though it's used by in-block clips, is still fed from the top with a fixed mag. As you can see, there's no bolt relation. Just press down, and I can't do this with one hand. Sorry. So, yeah, only a few hundred of these were made. It's doubtful that any of them actually went to the front and fought against the Germans. Uh, once the Germans had invaded the, the, the MAS factory, they actually saw some tool room prototypes of the... Uh, the Moss 40, but they didn't really seem interested. It's, it's kind of odd. They, here we had a very well developed, uh, been in you know, development for nearly two decades. The Germans just kind of snubbed it. So these uh, languished until uh, France was liberated in 1944, and in this version, the MLE 1944 was, uh, was adopted. As soon as France uh, regained control, it uh, put these into production. These were adopted by the French Navy. About 6,600 were produced of this particular model, and um, they were they were used at the tail end of World War II. This one has a barrel date of 1945. They were also used in uh, Indochina and uh, by the French Marines and throughout 1946 and up into the 1950s. And uh, they they proved very robust, very reliable. It's not terribly heavy. It has an intermediate length barrel. I believe this is 22, maybe 24, yeah, I think it's 22, should have looked that up, I apologize, but anyway, it's a, you know, short rifle length barrel, not a carbine, very nice milled receiver, has a very effective safety right here, kind of SKS style, very easy to actuate, nice large uh, synthetic coated uh, charging handle, plenty accurate adjustable sights, I mean, nothing special, it's a peep sight, hooded front post, the band as you saw, uh, wood furniture, and um, that's pretty much it. This receiver is pretty remarkable. It's very, uh, very solid milled. They disassemble easily. They disassemble into very large components. So you can tell they really learned their lesson from the RSC 1917. They, they made a very reliable, durable uh, weapon here. So this is the uh, Moss 44. And, uh, We'll move on to a few other uh, self letters. All right, up next we have a Moss Model 1949. This is a very similar rifle to the 1944. It was the next evolution in the series. Same, uh, same action, same detachable magazines. In fact, the mags are totally interchangeable between the two, and there's not really much of a difference. Uh, this is just a slightly updated version. This one was made for the French Army and has a few extra things compared to the 44. One of them is this scope rail, which, which became standard on the side. It took a dovetail type scope, uh, which is a, kind of an inter infantry first. They if issued many, uh, many scopes for these and uh, gave to kind of uh, not sniper grade but DMR grade type of type of accuracy. They also slightly updated and improved the rear sight. It's now windage adjustable and the hood has been or the, the aperture has been changed up a little bit. It also has a different style front sight, especially the protective ears. They now these two posts as opposed to a full loop. The biggest change however is on this end You'll notice there's no uh, bayonet on this version, and it has this 48 millimeter grenade sight. Flips up here. This is your sight. You can see the two posts there and there. Just down. Just tension. And there's a little worm wheel here. Now this one's stiff. So I can get it 
to it, it just it raises this uh, bar right there, as you see. And that's to adjust for range on this uh, French style grenade. This is the same type of launcher used on the Moss 36 uh, GL48. Later you'll see something similar, but for 22 millimeter grenades on the, uh, the Moss 3651 you saw in our other video. It has an attached grenade launcher. There's a few variants of this type. There is a variant made for Syria that actually retained the uh, the spike type bayonet from the Moss 44 and the Moss 36. So you, you, quite, you see quite a few of those. They only made about mm, five, six thousand of the Syrian ones, but because most of them got imported into the USA, you actually see them pretty frequently in the US. Also, after the 48 millimeter grenades were discontinued in the French military, a lot of the ones in French military service had the grenade launcher removed. So you'll, you'll, you'll see some without the grenade launcher and that's correct. They, they pulled those off. They made about 20,000 of these. They started to tool up and make them in, in 1950. However, the, um, the U.S. donated, Lynn Lee's top donation, oh, about 70,000 M1 Grands and 50,000 M1 Carbines to the French military, so they didn't have to, you know, immediate need for more self-loaders. And then later, the U.S. even donated more. I mean, I think the numbers got up to the 100,000, you know, 200,000, 300,000 mark. So the U.S. was giving France quite a few guns, and they were trying to do that to standardize on caliber. The U.S. was trying to get everyone to go to 30 out six, and then later um, the 30 cal light rifle cartridge, which became a 7.62 NATO. So they had their own motives. However, uh, France was sticking to their guns. This is still in 7.5. You'll see some of these out. Then uh, 7.62 uh, NATO. Those are all going to be uh, U.S. conversions. Uh, only a very few tool room type prototypes were made in, in 7.62, and uh, they, they, you just don't find them. Still very uh, similar trigger. Heavy but crisp. Perfectly good military safety type trigger. But uh, yeah, they just made uh, a little over 20,000 of these, and these were used by the French Army. And uh, these would lead to the final version, which you'll see in just a minute. But uh, these did see combat in Indochina at uh, Dinh Bun Phu and before. So, um, interesting rifles. And uh, I found this one actually. I thought since I had a Moss 44, I really didn't need a, a Moss 49. But I was in a gun store about a year and a half, two years ago, and there was this one here on the rack for just a smidge over $400. I just couldn't say no to a, a gun I didn't have for that money. These usually go for a good bit more than that, especially with the grenade launcher intact. And again, the Syrian versions, which are perfectly good, you, you see more of than the French mil military versions such as this. So I just went ahead and added it to my collection. I've always been a sucker for uh, French firearms. Well, we will move on. And up next is probably the most famous in this uh, line of uh, MAS self-loading rifle series. This is the model 1949-56. This model was uh, designed and developed in response to uh, basically uh, soldier feedback. It has, uh, soldiers had a lot to do with this rifle. They're, they were using the, the 44 and the 49 in um, Indochina and elsewhere in, in Africa and in, in East Asia, and uh, they kind of they kind of adopted some things. And this was this was France saying no, they weren't going to go with what NATO was doing, not the not the M1 Grand, not the M14, and not even the FAL. They wanted to keep on with what they were doing, and I don't blame them. At this point, they had invested over half a century in designing a self-loading rifle, and they they really had something good with the 49. It was reliable. It was durable, um, easy to train soldiers to use, so I don't blame them for, um, for kind of bailing on it, you know, not, not bailing on it. It was also heavy and uh, long, so that was kind of what they were going for with this thing. Starting at the muzzle, we have an, a muzzle brake, an actual muzzle brake to help with recoil. The barrel is 19 inches, and then with the brake and everything, it comes out to be about 21. It has a more easily adjustable grenade launcher. Just squeeze this, uh, flip it around here, squeeze this button. And this does shoot standard NATO 22 millimeter grenades. 
and uh, yeah, kind of where they, they did get standardized. This is the uh, the grenade sights here. You flip this up to turn off the gas, and then the uh, the lever lifts up. Sorry, not the lever, the lid, the ladder sights lift up. If I can do it, you have to kind of pull them out. There we go. And they have they lock there or there, depending on what you're using, different strategies and stuff. Hold it back down, and then turn your gas back on to um, keep shooting. As you can see, the front sight was also changed. Different ears, they're, you know, hollow from the sides. The forestock, or the forearm, was greatly shortened. It was kind of had this bob on the end to uh, keep your hand from walking out too far. Same style back here, but just shorter up there. Same type of receiver and coffee handle. All this back here is virtually the same as from the uh, 49. Still has this uh, scope rail on the side. The rear sight's been uh, made a little different yet again. Still windage and elevation adjustable, but now it's more squared off, made a little stronger. It also has a different field of view. Buttstock is the same, and these mostly came with these rubber recoil pads for shooting grenades. This one, I think, is dated 1962. Again, these take the same 10 round mags as the original 44 and 49, same direct impingement gas system, uh, same tilting bolt. Uh, they still disassemble very easily, the same, um, same type of safety. But yeah, this is basically a shortened and lightened version of the 49. And um, these went into service around 1957, 1958, and uh, over 275,000 were produced. These were in frontline service throughout the 60s and 70s. They were eventually phased out in the early 80s in favor of the FAMAS bullpup. But for over two decades, nearly 25 years, these were the front run weapon that uh, the French military was equipped with. They um, fought in Africa, East Asia, and of course they were kept in Europe. Uh, not that France ever had to fight there, but they were used on several continents and uh, were, were again very durable and reliable. These were lighter, which the soldiers appreciated. They were relatively expensive to mass produce by the standards of the 1960s, though. This is a machined receiver out of steel. It's not uh, cast or anything like that. And um, the quality on these is, is very nice. They have very uh, smooth bolts. This one here, we actually found in a pawn shop about uh, 15 years ago. Picked it up. At that time, I the only... Uh, French rifle I owned was the 75 uh, MAS uh, 36, the original one you saw in our other video. And at that time, I thought it would be uh, interesting to have uh, automatic. Plus, it was affordable, about 150 bucks back then, and um, came with quite a few accessories. It had detachable night sights. It's a device that goes out here. Uh, bayonet, uh, extra mags, cleaning kit. You know, nice, nice stuff. After uh, France was done using uh, the 4956, and for that matter the 49, they refurbished them and then they put them in storage. And then eventually uh, most of them got uh, purchased by Century Arms and uh, imported here into the U.S. and sold off during the, the 90s and early 2000s. Again, like I said with the 49, these were in 7.5. If you find one in 7.62 NATO or 308, it's a Century conversion. They just, they, France made so very few of these in that caliber that I just about bet you 99.9% .9 chance it's a U.S. conversion. Those have kind of a um, mixed reputation to dubious. They, um, some of the conversions worked fine, but a lot of them needed uh, continual work and tinkering to get to run right because that's just not what this gun was, was chambered for. It was chambered for the 7.5 by 54 of the French round. When in that chambering, these are very reliable, uh, durable guns, and um, they did very well. But um, yeah, they uh, they were in service for a while, and then uh, France went on to the um, to the FAMAS bullpup, which we'll put this guy back, and then we'll get the FAMAS out and show you that.